Yes, welcome once again. We are ready to begin our class. We are still doing the ABD Applied Bible Doctrine. And let's just begin by a word of prayer. Father, we thank you, bless you for this moment. Thank you because of your goodness and mercies upon our lives. Thank you for your grace. Thank you because of the illumination of your word right in our hearts. And also this moment we are asking that you may keep us through the class until we come to the end. We shall be grateful to you. Thank you for every student. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you so much and most welcome students. We had learned about uh, God's function, which we saw that God's function is grace. And we say that grace is something we don't deserve. And God chooses to give us something we don't deserve over something we deserve. We deserve to die, but God chose to give us grace, which is life, and we are alive because of him. And right now we want to move on, and we want to look at Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 22. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 22. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 22. I think we should read it. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 22. The Bible says, Do not say, I will recompense evil. Wait for the Lord and he will save you. I'll repeat, do not say, I will recompense evil. Wait for the Lord and he will save you. So many times uh, we are full of uh, revenge. We are full of issues that we feel that we can do by ourselves. But the Bible is encouraging us that we should leave God to do some things for us. So not everything belongs to us. Something belongs to us. Some things belong to God. Vengeance belongs to God. That's what the Bible says. So we are not to take vengeance ourselves. We have to take, uh, leave vengeance for God himself. And that's what that book is telling us. And uh, we have life and health from the word of God. The life we are having, let us remember, it is the life of God. As we had seen that when God created man, it was lifeless and lying down with 19 elements that forms a man. And we saw that uh, those are the, uh, the analysis that the scientists have done and realized out of God's formation, they discovered some elements in man. And when man was lying lifeless, God breathed into him the breath of life, which is God's life himself, and he became a living soul. And we also saw that uh, uh, we are not buying the issue of uh, evolution, because evolution is of Saturn, but we are of creation, which is of God in anthropology, the way we had seen before. So why am I connecting this? Is because we can see that we have life and health from the word of God. We are not uh, independent from the word of God, but we are interdependent of the word of God. I want to repeat the statement. We are not independent from the word of God, but we are interdependent uh, to God and his word. And so principle here, receive, apply, and have life. I want to mention again this principle of God's word. Uh, principle of God, God's word. Principle of God's word. Principle of God's word. And what is the principle of God's word here? Number one is here. Number two, we are talking of uh, receive. And number three, we are talking of uh, apply.
and then all this will result into life all this result into life so do you want to have life and not just life but life in abundance that the bible is talking about then you need these three you need to hear the word of god god after speaking to uh, the churches in the book of revelation he told them that let those who have ears hear what the holy spirit is speaking to the churches and so hearing you must be a good listener to hear the word of god correctly and not only just to hear but to receive there is a difference between hearing and receiving you can just hear some sounds but you don't understand so you don't receive but you hear with understanding whereby you receive god's life you receive god's word because god's word is life and therefore not only just hear not only just receive but also to apply also to apply then all these three combined together here receive apply they result into life then you are having life in abundance you are having life beyond this life all through to eternity that's why jesus said those who believe in me they will live in uh, as much as they die they will live and so there are many ways that our relationships are affected when we don't experience God's life. And so uh, when we talk of our relationships being uh, affected, relationships affected, relationships, relationships affected, When we don't hear the word of God, Saul failed to hear the word of God. God could speak through his servant, prophet Samuel, but Saul could not hear. That's why his relationship with God was affected. And every time we fail to hear the word of God, then our relationships with God are affected and not only our relationships with God but also with other people because God's works God works uh, relationally we saw it before that God works relationally uh, God the Father we have the Son and we have the Holy Spirit so every time we fail to hear the Word of God then our relationships are affected both with God and both with other people okay if you don't hear the word of God then your relationships will be affected they will be ruined with fellow servants that's why you find a lot of people are uh, like segregating themselves they don't wanna uh, harmonize and bond together with other people because their relationship with God has failed due to as a result of not hearing God then it uh, goes down it descends to his relationship with other people and so they are all affected Proverbs 15 verse 31 Proverbs 15 15 verse 31 what does it say the eyes that heareth the, uh, the reproof of life abideth among the wise. Okay, I again want us to read so that it can help us to understand it more. Proverbs 15 verse 31. The ear that hears the rebukes of life will abide among the wise. Wow, this is powerful. The ear that hears the rebuke of life will abide among the wise. So what does this teach us? It still brings us here, here, okay? The ears that hear 
the word of God will dwell among the wise. So this simply means that if you don't hear the word of God, then you are stupid, okay? Because the word of God will make you sit with the wise. So if you don't take the word of God, where do you expect to sit? You'll, spe you'll just sit among the stupid people who doesn't want to hear the word of God. And actually, the Bible is very clear on this, that uh, those who don't hear the word of God, they are fools, okay? And God hates folly. God hates folly. You better be a wise person who can hear the word of God and be rebuked by the word of God, be corrected by the word of God so that you are not a fool sitting in the company of fools because God hates folly. God hates folly and he doesn't want us to be fools. He wants us to hear correction, rebuke. He wants us to dwell with the wise. He wants us to check uh, that we are in line with this word. And so we find in church today, a lot of people hate rebuke. A lot of people doesn't want correction. A lot of people want to go it their own way. They want to be independent. And we saw that independence at some point is it's Satan's way of doing things, that he want to segregate you and kill you alone. He doesn't want you in the company of others because he's roaring like a lion looking for somebody to devour. And you, if you segregate yourself from the rest, you become a fool. Then he takes you away, he kills you, he destroys you, and is done with you. But God wants you to take the counsel, hear the rebuke, hear his word, hear the way of truth and life so that you can live and God be with you. We have seen that instruction always produces correction. A lot of people hate instruction. That's why they don't want to come to Bible school because they hate uh, correction. They don't want to be corrected. They don't want instructions. But instruction always produces correction. So uh, anybody that uh, doesn't like correction uh, that is a fool. In Proverbs 6.23, Proverbs 6.23, what does it say? Proverbs 6 and verse 23. Reprove is the way of life. Wow, this is powerful. Reprove is the way of life. If you hate reproof, then you are doomed because reproof is the way of life. If you want to go in the way of life, then you must accept reproof. And 1 Timothy 3.16, 1 Timothy 3.16, the Bible says, doctrine produces instruction, which produces correction. So the word of God, uh, we all know this scripture, 1 Timothy 3.16, the word of God, he is fully inspired by the Holy Spirit and is good for rebuke, for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, so that the man of God may be fully equipped, okay? We want to talk about false humility and false discipline. 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 False humility is violating God's principle of life. Violating God's principle of life. Uh, 
God's principle of life, okay? So, what is to violate God's principle of life? Number one, number one, how we can violate God's principle of life is to is negative reaction towards God. Negative reaction towards God. What is negative reaction towards God? Have you ever seen somebody who is going to church, a brother, a sister, and every time they are so negative towards the things of God, that's violating God's principle of life. They are very negative about the church. They are very negative about the pastors. They are very negative about other fellow members of the church. That's violating God's principle of life. Why? Because God intended that we may live together in unison, in love. And actually Jesus spoke and said that uh, by showing love to one another, you will make the world to know that you are truly my disciples. And so when one is negative and had negative, has negative reaction towards uh, God, then that is violating God's principle of life. God intended that body life may be one. We complement one another. I am gifted in this area. You are gifted in another area. And we should all complement one another. We should not be negative nor have negative reaction towards God's, uh, God's uh, way of life. And so let us avoid and try as much as we can that we may not be negative or have negative reaction towards God's word. And number two is rejection of self, okay? Rejection of self. Rejection of self. The Bible talks about self-denial and not self-rejection. There is a difference between self-denial and self-rejection. Self-denial is a time whereby you give up your interest for the interest of the kingdom of God or the word of God. We saw in, uh, I believe it was in New Testament survey, that we did something to do with Thusia. I believe you can remember Thusia. And this word Thusia. It's a Greek word which means sacrifice. Sacrifice, okay? To give, uh, to forfeit our own interest and to obey that which is more superior, which is God's word. That was to see a sacrifice. And so we are saying about self-denial is when we do sacrifice to see we are giving up our own interest for the word of God. There are very many things that we have denied ourselves for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we should not reject ourselves because when you reject yourself, it simply means that uh, you are violating God's principle of life. Why? God says, love other people as you love yourself. So you must first love yourself, not reject yourself. And self-love 
is all about appreciating the work of grace of God upon your life. That's self-love. Self-love is not about me, 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 me syndrome. It's about accepting and appreciating uh, God's grace at work in your life and just allow God to love you because God loves us with an everlasting love, agape love, and that love, we must accept it in our lives that indeed God loves us. And when he loves us, we appreciate the grace and we deny ourselves the things of this world so that we can attain the best, which is the kingdom things. And number three is rebellion to someone in the church family. Rebellion. to someone in the church family. The church family. Rebellion to someone in the church family. Yes, there are people who are so rebellious and they are not aware of God's principle of life that it is God's will for us to be together as one, as the body of Christ. We are not independent from one another, but we are interdependent and we need one another. And so if you see somebody in rebellion to someone in the church family, then they are violating God's principle of life because God's principle of life is that we may unite as God's people, as children of God. And some may bring in issues of ethnicity and some issues of one's background, educational background or uh, economical background, etc., etc., which is not God's principle of life. That's violating because once you rebel against someone in the church family, that so and so cannot tell me anything. What exactly can he tell me? Then you are violating God's principle of life. Every person can tell you something. I teach, but you can tell me something because we are all interdependent one to another. Acts chapter 20, verse 27. Acts 20, 27. Acts 20, 27. People deny some things in their lives. This can be, okay, let's uh, go about it before we proceed with the point I want to make. Acts 20, verse 27. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore take heed all yourself, to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. I want to repeat that verse 27. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. That is Paul speaking. I have not shunned to, uh, to teach to you or to speak to you the whole counsel of God's truth. When one denies facts about his life, Christ didn't die for evil but for sins. We must not deny what God says about us, that we are, God says we are special people, we are his children, and therefore we, shall, we should not deny such facts. And we can see that, uh, let's move a bit forward. Let's look at these uh, also Isaiah 5 verse 20. Isaiah 5 verse 20. Isaiah 
Isaiah 5 verse 20. <clears throat> the Bible says, Woe unto them that call evil good, and good evil, that put darkness for light, and light for darkness, that put bitter to sweet, and sweet for bitter. Okay, what does the Bible tell us here? Woe unto them that call evil good. So, in short, God is telling us, let us call good good, and evil evil. Let us not try to call evil good, okay? God's word is very clear. And when the Bible teaches us on the doctrine of the Bible, then we should not try to bend it so that it can favor us. We should not try to make it lenient so that it can be, it can sound good to us. Let us take it the way it is. And that is uh, the reason why the Bible says in this Isaiah 5 verse 20, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. Don't interchange the scripture. Let the scripture be the way they are. Don't try to mix them up so that it can be lenient or favor you in any way. Let the scripture be the scripture the way it is. And that put darkness for light and light for darkness. Those are the principles of the world. When you hear news coming up, sometimes it's the opposite. You think that's the plain truth, but you realize it's the opposite altogether. But that's not the same way with God's word. Because God's word is very specific. And when it's good, it calls it good. When it's evil, it calls it evil. And let it remain that way. Don't uh, bend it. Don't add. Don't remove from it. And uh, let's move also to Proverbs 21, verse 26. Proverbs 21, 26. 21, and verse 26. We must read a lot of scriptures because uh, this is applied Bible doctrine and so we must check on doctrine well and explain and find where there might be questions that may uh, trigger controversies or somebody may try to come up with even as we go along. We are looking at this Proverbs 21 verse 26. Proverbs 21, 26. It says, He covets greedily all day long, but the righteous gives and does not spare. He covets greedily all day long, but the righteous gives and does not spare. Covets greedily all day long, but the righteous giveth and spares not. Well, this one is very literal, just the way it's coming. Uh, when we come to the principle of giving, the Bible says in these Proverbs that he covets all greedily all the day long, but the righteous giveth and spares not. There are people who twist scriptures just the way we have said before so that it can suit them. And when they do that, then you find it lacks meaning. And that's why Proverbs says that he covets greedily all day long. They desire a lot of things, yet nothing is happening, but the righteous giveth and spares not. If you are a child of God, then giving towards the work of God will not be a problem to you because everything belongs to God and you also belongs to God. But don't twist scripture so that you can force it out of people to give because the Bible says that the righteous giveth and spares not so that you can take advantage over them. But you should understand that uh, even I myself, I am not exempted from the scriptures. Anytime the scripture is read, people throw it to other people. That is not mine. 
you, that's yours, you should listen to that one. Then another will throw it also to someone else. <laughs> that one belongs to sister so-and-so. She's the one that sits down when people are giving their offerings. And uh, somebody else will throw it to someone else. It belongs to so-and-so. All these scriptures apply to all of us. I, as a pastor teacher, I, as a preacher, I, as the teacher here, I am not exempted from what we are reading and learning. I am also a practitioner and I am also a disciple of Jesus Christ and I must, I must take heed of these things or the word of God, what it says about me. Let's go to Jeremiah 29, Jeremiah 22, 29. Jeremiah 22, 29. We said that ABD is all about uh, perusing and going through scriptures uh, because we are looking at uh, applied Bible doctrine in some of the key verses that can help us. Jeremiah 22, 29. O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. The only time we have in the Bible triple salutation. Okay, this is the only time we hear uh, this triple salutation in the Bible, Jeremiah 22, 29, O earth, the prophet wrote, O earth, but he didn't stop there. He went ahead and said, earth again, and the third time, earth, hear the word of the Lord. This is so powerful. We call it triple salutation. Triple Salutation. Triple salutation. O earth. 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 That's times three. And this is uh, very key because it was about making emphasis on how powerful the word of God is. You can note that one down. Triple salutation in Jeremiah 22, 29 was all about uh, emphasis on how it's important to hear the word of God, okay? It's all em about emphasis on how important it is to hear the word of God. And let's move to Matthew 13, 13. Matthew 13. And verse 13, you'll read a lot of scriptures until you get uh, drunk of the word of God. <laughs> yes, we read a lot of scriptures until you get drunk of the word of God. Yes, that's what is supposed to be. The Bible says we, we should not get drunk of wine but we should be drunk of the Holy Spirit. And the Word of God is the Holy Spirit, inspired by the Holy Spirit. So I believe some of you are already drunk and getting drunk of the Word of God because we are reading a lot of scriptures. <laughs> That's all about ABD, scripture after scripture. Therefore, the Bible says in Matthew 13, 13, Therefore speaks I to them in parables, because they see, seeing, see not, and hearing, they hear not, neither do they understand. This is the principles of hearing. That Jesus, as he was speaking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the crowd, and the, he was saying, well, specifically to the Pharisees and the Sadducees who were the leaders and the scribes and the people who had knowledge about the word of God. Jesus is saying that he was speaking in parables. Why? Because they have eyes but they don't see. Their eyes are open to see the things of the world and not the, the inner sight of seeing the word of God. They hear 
but they don't understand why even today in church today in our lives people have eyes but they don't see not the physical eyes but the spiritual eyes but they can't see things are happening but they can't see yet they have got eyes people cannot understand even what they hear they hear yes they are ears, but they don't hear you preach in church they don't hear you speak the things of God, they don't hear, yet they have ears. They don't take in. Why? That's why Jesus was speaking in parables, so that those who are in the Spirit may grab and capture what exactly the Word of God is all about. It all emphasizes about the Word of God and the importance of the Word of God, as we had seen that God's life and God's principle of life is to give us grace. Let me get to get some point here, which is uh, Yes, we are at this point whereby Jesus is saying they have ears, but they don't hear nor understand. They have eyes, but they don't see. This is a wicked generation. We are praying to God that we may have believers in Christ who will hear with their ears and see with their spiritual eyes what is happening in the world and stand in the gap for the work of God, for the word of God, selflessly, and with good attitude and intention towards the service of God and not after their own flesh, not after their own desires, not after their own way and to just uh, get what they want but to do what God instructs us to do. That is what we pray for in this generation. Sincerity is not enough to serve God but we need the word of God. Okay, sincerity is not enough. Sincerity is not enough. It's not enough to serve God. Sincerity is not enough to serve God, okay? We have to note that one because some people think that uh, once they are sincere, then they can serve God. I'm honest, I'm sincere, I want to serve God. That is okay and very good, thank God you are sincere. But that one alone is never enough, but we need the word of God. But we need the, we need the word of God. The word of God. So, it still brings us to the Word of God, okay? It still brings us to the Word of God. You can be a very good person, but without the Word of God, it's never enough. You can be a very honest person, very sincere, but that one alone is not enough. We need to learn the Word of God, okay? We need to study the Word of God. There are people who believe that the Holy Spirit is the best teacher. Thumbs up and very good, the Holy Spirit is the best teacher. But we have other teachers who are not the best. So these teachers will teach you, then the Holy Spirit confirms, okay? By sealing the teachings. So you must study, you have no option of studying the Word of God. The Bible says we saw in the same class that, or the previous class, we saw that uh, we were not only called to uh, preach, but also to teach and to baptize. So, teachings comes in there. You must be taught the Word of God. Whether you dispute it, whether you reject it, you still need to learn and study the Word of God. And so, that's where it brings us that sincerity is not enough 
to serve God, but we also need the word of God all the time. In Colossians 3.16, the Bible says, let the word of God dwell in you richly. Let the word of God dwell in you richly. Uh, Colossians, uh, this is uh, 3 verse 16. You become rich, okay? Rich in the word of God. When you become rich in the word of God, you are rich in everything. Many people want the riches of the world, but they don't want to be rich of the word of God. Everything starts in the spiritual, then it manifests into the physical, and so we must be rich of the word of God. The problem of the church today is that they don't know their real need. The problem of the church today is that they don't know their real need. We call it real need. Do you know the real need of the church? Or we are also in the same problem that the church is facing today. We don't know the real need of the church. You know when Jesus was walking along, he came across a blind man who was called Bartimaeus. And it was specific to the question that, uh, what do you want, okay? So Bartimaeus said, I want to see. He was very specific, I want to see, okay? So many times we don't know the exact need, what we want. That's why we, when we go to pray, we pray all of our prayers. Wah, 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 this, that, this, that you touch this or that, and you are not specific of exactly what you want. But Maya said, I want to see. So what's the exact need of the church today? Because thou sayest, I'm rich, I'm increased with good, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. <laughs> Okay, when Christ said that whoever will follow me, let him hate his father and mother and follow me. What did he meant? When God, when Christ said, okay, let's analyze this. When Christ said, when Christ said, he who will follow me, will follow me, must hate his father and mother. So what did he meant when he said this statement? Because we are looking at how we can apply the doctrine into our lives. And we can see that this statement was not literal. When Jesus said this, it, it wasn't literal. It wasn't literal. But figurative. Okay? In some classes, previous ones, we learned about when the Bible talks literally and when it talks figuratively. And some scriptures are not to be applied literally, some are to be applied figuratively. And when he said, when uh, that whoever will follow me must hate his father is not literal but figurative. Why? It simply means that you hate the sin. Hate the sin in them if they are not believers, okay? 
When God said to Abraham, leave your father and mother, why was God telling him so? God was telling him to leave because they were worshipping the moon god, okay? They were worshipping the moon god. His father, Terah, was a moon worshipper. And so God had to separate him from the father and the mother and his people who had refused, remember that one, who had refused to turn to God and they had to stick in moon worship. That's why God had now to separate Abraham from his people. And so when God, Jesus said, let he must hate his father and mother, it was figurative that you should hate the sin in them. And especially if they refuse to turn to God, then you must hate that sin in them. And not literally, you have to love your parents. Praise God. You have to love your parents because we have been commanded to love everybody, not only our parents, but even our enemies. The Bible says, let us love them. And so, we should know how to apply these scriptures. For one to be Christ's disciples, he needs to deal with the natural affection. For one to be Christ's disciples, for one to be Christ's disciple, Christ's disciples, disciple. Okay. He needs to deal with the natural affection. To deal with natural affection. And that one we can see in Luke 9.23. 9.23, that says, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself, carry up his cross daily, and let him follow me. Let him deny himself, follow me. I once talked to a lady who was like, my husband uh, doesn't want me to go to church. And so what do I do? We are living together. And I told her not to leave the husband, but just keep praying. Why? Because uh, the Bible doesn't teach us that we leave our people because of any other reason except if they refuse to turn to God. So I told her to keep praying for the husband. Maybe the husband will get saved. The only problem is when, if the husband says that from today, you shall worship my God and not that you are God, then that's very obvious that you cannot leave God for anybody. Praise God. So when it comes to such a case, then it's a different case together. The same with our parents. When they say, today, from today, we don't want this nonsense of going to church, then you must leave them. Because that's why Abraham was had to leave his people. And again, the statement of Jesus comes to effect by this. And so, <clears throat> our relationship should be threefold. Let's look at this as we... Uh, winding up, our relationship should be threefold. Our relationships should be threefold.
should be threefold okay should be threefold how our relationships should be threefold how number one is love and number two is life In number three, we are talking of light. Our relationships should be threefold, which means our relationships should be based on love. And not just love, but agape love, the love of God. The difference between agape love and filial love and uh, sensual love because in Greek we are having five types of love, okay? Five types of love. We are having the filial, we are having the sensual, we are having the eros, and we are having the Greek, which is the love of God, agape. So all our relationships should be based on agape love, which is unconditional. This is the highest form of love, which has never been experienced in human race and therefore it is unconditional. It counts no wrong, it abides and the unconditional love is not what you are giving to me, what I'm gaining from you. Other loves depends on what they gain from you, okay? Most of the loves are based on how I benefit from you. Uh, so and so as a car, so I'll be his friend, so that uh, when I need a car, I can get it easily. <laughs> okay, that's what the world teaches, and uh, most Christians are buying it, that look at your friends, don't walk with useless friends, okay? We don't have useless friends. All friends are useful. That's why you see even uh, Judas was walking with Jesus Christ, okay? He was a friend, he was a disciple, and he was walking with Jesus Christ, okay? Jesus was God, and why couldn't Jesus just uh, single him out and say, you? get out from my company, I don't want to see you anymore. <laughs> he is all-knowing, okay? He knew what was inside him, but he didn't rebuke him that get out and stop following me. So he was still there. So most friendships or people today are like, okay, so-and-so is having a very good and beautiful home, so I have to be his friend so that when I'll be in need of any big function I can take to his home. <laughs> what they will get, ah, that uh, let me be friend so and pastor so and so because he has a church. So once I'll be having a function I can borrow his church. But with God, he wants us to base our relationship of unconditional love. Even when you cannot help me back, I still love you, okay? With the brotherly love, the agape love of Christ. When you have nothing, I still love you. Because if I love you because you are having a car and you can uh, lend me a car, how about when your car will be broken or when you don't have a car anymore? Then you find that the love is not there and the relationship is ruined. But God expects us to dwell on agape love, the unconditional love of God. There are even some women who st may stick to you because you are doing well. But when you are broke, they leave you. That is conditional love. God expects us to dwell on unconditional love. A certain man uh, asked the wife that why do you love me so, so much? Can you give me the reason for loving me? But the woman replied and said, 
I don't have any reason for loving you. I just love you. <laughs> so, if you are to ask your wife today, why do you love me? <laughs> I loved him because he's tall and dark. Some may say so, okay? I love you because you provide us, you buy us meat twice per week. <laughs> So it means when you won't buy meat twice per week, then she won't love you. When they have a reason to love you, they will also have a reason to leave you, okay? But when they don't have a reason to love you, then they won't have a reason to leave you either. I don't have any reason for loving you. If I may ask you today that why do you love God? Somebody will say, because God is good. How good is God? Because he gave me a wife. Because he gave me children. Another goodness of God, he gave me money when I wanted money. Okay? <laughs> and the list is on and on. But can we come to a point of having no reason to love God, but we just love him? Praise the Lord. I love God. Whether he has given me money or I'm broke, I still love him. I love God. Whether he has given me children or I don't have. I love God just because I love him. He died for me, okay? And so, our relationships should be threefold. Love, life, and what is life? We said we are living God's life, okay? We are not living our own lives. And number three, light. Let it be open. What is light? The word of God is light. So when we live and our relationships are based on the light of the word of God, life of God, the love of God, agape love, that we will be having good relationships. We need to fellowship with God and other saints. Fellowship with demons or wrong people will make one negative towards God, okay? Fellowship with demons and wrong people will make one negative towards God because we need to fellowship with God and other saints. We need to have good relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ, okay? And not with demons, not with people who are negative towards God. And I want us to finish from that point our class right now because we shall proceed next time. And uh, we are still moving on with applied Bible doctrine, ABD, whereby we are jumping from scripture to scripture, bringing them all together. And we are trying to look at how uh, biblically we are supposed to apply the biblical doctrines in our lives so that they can affect our lives and they can be of great benefits to us. May God bless you so much and keep you all our students as we are winding with the word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, we bless you. We give you glory and all the honor. May your name be lifted now and forever. Bless our souls and spirits together with you to be united all the time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Shalom. God bless you.